So after we are done with the, uh, the nasal mucosa, the openings in the lateral walls, uh, we will move on towards the blood supply of the nose uh, because it holds a great clinical significance and we should know about the arterial supply as well as the venous drainage of the nose. All right. So first I'll, I'll take the arterial supply. Here in front of you are the two drawings. Okay. By just looking at this drawing, we can understand that this is one of the lateral nasal walls. Okay. So because we can see these turbinates, all right, hard palate is there, the frontal bone, the ethmoid bone, which is the cribriform plate part of the ethmoid bone and the sphenoid bone and here is hanging down from the back of the nose is the nasopharynx all right the second drawing this is drawing a the drawing b is actually it's not showing the lateral nasal wall it's showing the septum of the nose okay so we know from our previous knowledge that the, just like the, the architecture, the entire architecture of the nose, the anterior two-third is made up of hyaline cartilage. So not just the lateral nasal walls, but the, 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 the intranasal septum, or the, the, sep, the nasal septum is also formed, anterior two-third is formed by cartilage, and the posterior one-third is osteous or bony, all right? So this, this red, oh, sorry, the black colored dotted line is indicating the anterior two-third cartilaginous part of the septum and the posterior one-third osseous or the bony part of the septum and here again the the nasopharynx part is visible even if you take a section like this is a paramedian section which is sparing the the septum all right while this is the mid sagittal section in which we have removed like the septum has been sectioned so you can see through uh, the, lateral, the inside of the lateral nasal wall. All right, now enough with the orientation. Now I will start on with our, the, uh, the blood vessels which are visible, okay? So here you can see one of the vessels <clears throat> which is present inside the cranial cavity. This is the ophthalmic artery, all right? Ophthalmic artery is giving off the brain. By the way, before that, I have to, to mention that we can divide the lateral nasal wall into different zones, okay, for our own descriptive purposes. So this is the anterior inferior region, anterior and inferior region. This is the anterior superior region, okay. Then this is the posterior superior region. This region is the central zone or the central region of the, the lateral wall of the nose. All right. Now come back to the to the blood supply. Here you can see the ophthalmic artery is giving off branches, right? So I should write down the names. I will use three different colors so that you will have the color coding in your mind. So the uh, the ophthalmic artery is giving off anterior ethmoidal. Artery, arteries rather, and posterior ethmoidal artery. So the, the anterior ethmoidal arteries are there, all right, and then posterior ethmoidal. <clears throat> Both anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries are the branches of ophthalmic artery. Ophthalmic. I hope you're able to see. Uh, this part of the board, ophthalmic artery, right, which is a branch of, it's, it's emerging from the internal carotid artery. This is the first branch that has been given off by the internal carotid artery the moment it enters the cranial cavity, all right? So the ophthalmic artery is giving off two branches to the lateral wall of the nose, actually to the nose in general. Which, which will be taking, these two branches will be taking care of the top part of the nose, the anterior superior and the posterior superior parts of the nose, the lateral wall of the nose as well as the septum. So internal 
silk carotid system. I C A. Okay. All right. Then you can see one, two, and three other vessels. Right. Now I'll use a color, the purple one. Um, this is one of the branches of if you if you know that the external carotid artery is giving off almost seven branches outside the cranial cavity it never enters the cranial cavity all right because that's why it's known as external carotid one of the most important branches of the external carotid is the maxillary artery all right the maxillary artery is, is actually the major blood supply to the entire face, the, the cavities which are present on our face. <clears throat> that includes the nasal cavity as well. All right, so the, the maxillary artery, it gives off a branch which is going towards the nasal pharynx, a pharyngeal branch, a pharyngeal branch, which will be taking care of the very back part of the nose, all right? Pharyngeal branch from the maxillary. Then we have another branch, a very important branch, that is known as the sphenopalatine artery. It's been given off by the maxillary artery within the sphenopalatine fossa or the pterygopalatine fossa. You might have heard this name. We'll be doing the details of the pterygopalatine fossa and the different branches and divisions of the maxillary artery when we'll be discussing the head and neck, specifically the facial skeleton and the, the spaces present in the face. All right. At this moment, we are concerned with two of its branches. The pharyngeal branch of the maxillary artery, which has been given off very posteriorly, and it will be taking care of the nasal pharynx and the very back part of the nose. All right. While the sphenopalatine artery, which had been given off in the pterygopalatine region, it's also known as the sphenopalatine fossa. So that the sphenopalatine artery will enter the nose, the nasal cavity, through the lateral nasal wall. It it it, it has its own opening. The sphenopalatine uh, foramen, which is present in the lateral nasal wall on each side, all right? So the sphenopalatine artery is taking care of the major central zone of sphenopalatine branch. And the purple is representing the maxillary artery. Artery. All right, so we have an ophthalmic artery, which is a part of ICA system, internal carotid system. Then we have the maxillary artery, which is the ECA system, external carotid artery system. All right, the purple is representing the maxillary artery. Then we have another branch of the external carotid artery that has been given off uh, the moment it climbs up to the face, just, just at the level of the base of mandible, it gives off a branch that is known as a facial artery, all right? The name is indicating it must be serving the face, the structures on the face, all right? So the facial artery gives off a branch that is known as the lateral nasal branch of facial facial artery all right so we have three sources as a matter of fact ophthalmic artery giving off the anterior and posterior ephemeral arteries which are taking care of the top part of the lateral wall of the nose as well as the septum we'll talk about the septum in a few seconds all right, then we have the maxillary artery, which is, the, which is a branch from the external carotid artery system. It gives off a pharyngeal branch, which takes care of the nasopharynx part. And then it gives off a sphenopalatine artery, a branch, which is responsible for the, the, the supply of the central zone of the lateral nasal wall. Then we have uh, another branch from the external carotid artery, that is facial artery, it gives off a branch, the lateral nasal artery, which supplies the anterior, anterior inferior region of the lateral wall of the nose. 
all right okay so you can see on this drawing that I haven't made those anastomoses but they are there all these vessels are you know anastomosing the branches the fine branches are anastomosing with each other they're talking to each other all right so there is as in the beginning of our nose lectures I mentioned that the nasal mucosa is richly supplied by blood because it needs to humidify the inspired air, inhaled air, right? It has to bring the temperature of, their, of the air closer to the body, internal body temperature. So we have an extensive blood supply, all right? So that both the external carotid and the internal carotid systems they are anastomosing extensively in the walls of the nose as well as on the septum. Okay, this is a point to be noted. All right, now come to the septum. If we look at the septum over here, now come to the, the blood supply of the septum. Um, we can see over here the same blood vessels are supplying the septum, their branches are supplying the septum of the nose as well. Uh, the ophthalmic artery giving off the posterior ethmoidal and anti-ethmoidal branches. The, the sphenopalatine branch of the maxillary artery is also serving the central region of the septum. Then, uh, then over here, just first have a look at this branch. It's, uh, let me write it down for you, that the facial artery gives off a branch. So this is the upper lip, superior lip. So uh, the, uh, the uh, facial artery gives off a branch which is the superior labial branch. Labial means lip. Superior labial branch of facial artery. Okay? So the superior labial branch of the facial artery gives off a branch which is known as the septal branch. Okay? Sept Sorry. septal branch of superior labial artery, okay, which is a branch of facial artery, okay. Again, we have the maxillary contribution, the facial artery contribution, the ophthalmic artery contribution. There is another vessel which is visible over here. A branch of the maxillary, another branch of the maxillary artery, the greater palatine artery. It just travels within the cover of the mucosa of heart palate and it runs pretty much close to the bone of the heart palate in the mouth and it gives off a, an incisive branch of the greater palatine nerve also climbs up, up to the level of septum, the inferior, anti-inferior part of the septum. Okay? So we know about these branches from our previous drawing. Just a new uh, addition was a branch of the Greater Palatine, which is the uh, incisive branch, the incisive artery. This is the incisive, incisive, sorry, incisive branch of greater palatine artery, which is a branch of maxillary, okay? So the incisive branch is a new thing, then a septal branch of the superior labial artery of, which is again a branch of facial artery. These were the two new things. Now, you can see this area, there is an extensive anastomosis that has been indicated in this area. Right? This green colored circle is indicating an area which is known as the Little's area and we can also call it Kieselbeck's area. Kieselbeck's area. All right. It holds a great clinical significance where the three arteries, uh, the branches of three arteries are anastomosing ex extensively in the Littles area or Kieselbach's area. 
the anti-ethamoidal artery, as you can see, branches of the sphenopalatine artery, majority of the branches of the sphenopalatine, and then incisive uh, branch of the gray palatine artery, and one more, the septal branch of the supia labial artery. All right, so we have again an anastomosis between the ICA system, the internal carotid artery system, and the ECA system, which is the external carotid artery system. This little area, it just uh, is the most uh, prone spot of the nose that suffers from nosebleed. That is, the, the condition is known as epistaxis. Ep epistaxis. All right, epistaxis is the common nose bleed. Uh, the, uh, we'll talk about the epistaxis or, uh, in detail, uh, but you have to keep in mind that the Kieselbach's area is the area from where the, mostly the branches of the sphenopalatine artery, they bleed profusely, right? Now, uh, we will discuss the details about the venous return or the venous drainage of the nose. Okay, so the veins, you in general, they duplicate the pattern of the arteries. Okay, so we have the anterior posterior ethmoidal arteries uh, supplying the upper part of the nose and the nasal septum. So we would be having the, the ethmoidal veins ultimately be draining into the inferior of pelvic vein. Because if you re recall, the ephemoidal arteries are, are the branches from the ophthalmic artery. So there, if there is an ophthalmic artery, there must be an ophthalmic vein. Okay? So there are two ophthalmic veins, superior ophthalmic and the inferior ophthalmic vein. So you can have a look at the skull here. So the superior ophthalmic and the inferior ophthalmic veins they will be actually draining the contents of the orbit, including the nasal cavity, okay? So the inferior of palmic vein will be receiving the blood, venous blood from the upper part of the nose. And you can see over here something which is very important. It's lying above the cella tersica or the, the pituitary fossa, which is a part of the sphenoid bone, body of the sphenoid bone. This is the Cavernous sinus, okay? This is cavernous sinus. It's one of the dural venous sinuses, which is extremely, it's a paired sinus, one on the right side and the other on the left side. It's extremely important to know about the cavernous sinus, which is present at the undersurface of the brain, like between the, the skull bone and the, uh, let me show it to you, it's residing above here, like this is the cella tersica, where the pituitary gland is resting in a live state. On top are the two cavernous sinuses. So they receive the inferior ophthalmic vein and the superior ophthalmic veins. So we are talking about the inferior ophthalmic vein, the, uh, they are draining into the cavernous sinus, draining the nasal cavity, so the venous blood from the nose can go to, or it does go to the cavernous sinus directly through the, uh, via the uh, inferior ophthalmic veins. And by the way, just keep in mind that all the small veins of uh, this region, they are valveless veins. So there is no inhibition in the flow. All right, so uh, then uh, if we think about the central zone, we know that there is a sphenopalatine artery, so, which is a branch of the maxillary artery. So the, the maxillary vein will be receiving the venous blood from the central region of the nose, the lateral wall as well as the septum. The maxillary vein is, is up here in this maxillary region is the maxillary vein and here this is the region where in which I'm you know passing my probe and you can see this is the region in the skull or the facial skeleton which is known as the infratemporal fossa 
Within the infratemporal fossa, I hope that you're able to see my probe, it's shining. Within the infratemporal fossa, there is a plexus of veins that is known as pterygoid plexus of veins. So the maxillary vein is connecting with the pterygoid plexus of vein. So the nasal venous blood is also going to the pterygoid plexus, okay? Then at the back, we know that there are nasopharynx. So the, the, there was a pharyngeal artery. So the, the vein would be dumping the, the blood from the, the posterior part of the nose as well as the nasopharynx into the pharyngeal plexus of veins, okay? So it, the nose is connected to the pharynx also. And then here at the anterior and inferior region, we have the facial branches, okay? The facial artery branches. So the facial vein will be receiving the venous blood from this region. And the facial vein ultimately drains into the internal jugular vein within our neck, okay? So now you can, by just looking at this map, like a simplified map of the venous drainage, you can easily figure it out that the venous blood of the nose is going into so many plexuses, involving so many spaces, cavities, okay? So if anything goes wrong, if, if there is some sort of infection residing or if there is any sort of cancer process going on in the nasal region as well as the paranasal sinuses, it is going to affect the intracranial structure. So uh, one condition would be the cavernous sinus thrombosis that can be a, a result of the infection, the ascending type of infection, like the rhinitis, the chronic rhinitis, may lead to meningitis, which is the inflammation of the dura mater, and the meninges, the other meninges. And then that meningitis can also lead to encephalitis. Like it's, these are the, the, the ultimate results, but they usually do not happen in the daily life. But yes, nose is a very, very, uh, sensitive region so if I sketch over here you might have seen this picture at many places on many occasions this is the face and if I draw this is the from the outer yeah I should draw it like this from the outer angle of the mouth to the inner region of or the inner margin of the orbit. This is the this is known as the danger zone, the danger triangle. Okay, anything which is happening in this region, including the angles of mouth, the entire nose, that, that nasal cavity, including the paranasal sinuses, and the medial walls of the, the orbits, they can end up ultimately into the cranial cavity. Okay, that's why it is really very important to understand the map of the venous drainage of nose. So I will say that the, the, via the inferior ophthalmic veins, the upper part of the nose will be draining into the cavernous sinus. Via the, uh, the sphenopalatine uh, vessels, the, 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 the maxillary vein will be draining the central region of the nose and the maxillary vein is dumping its blood into the pterygoid sinus, uh, pterygoid plexus of veins, which is located in the infratemporal fossa of the face. And the back part of the nose is being drained into the pharyngeal plexus. That is also very important. Pharyngeal plexus of veins, okay, which is lying on the uh, wall of the pharynx and the anterior part of the nose was draining into via the facial vein it's draining into the internal jugular vein which ultimately opens up into the superior vena cava uh, after joining the uh, subclavian it becomes the brachiocephalic vein and then dumps the blood into the right atrium of the heart okay so uh, here we are done with the, the blood supply Hopefully, the concepts are clear to you guys. Now, I have to talk about the, uh, the nerve supply, briefly, the nerve supply of the nose and paranasal sinuses. That also is important. We have to know about the sensory innovation pattern as well as the autonomic control of the nose, the nasal glands, 
and the paranasal glands, okay? Paranasal sinuses glands. So, you must have seen this drawing. There is a map of the sensory innovation. So, there is a nerve, the, third, uh, the fifth cranial nerve, which is known as the trigeminal nerve, okay? The trigeminal nerve, or fifth cranial nerve, okay? Right? This trigeminal nerve is taking care of the sensory innovation of the entire facial skin and subcutaneous tissue, okay? And also the mucosal linings of the orbits, the nasal cavity, and the oral cavity. All the three divisions of trigeminal nerve. We'll be discussing the nerve in, in detail when we'll do the, the head and neck uh, lectures. But at this moment, we have to understand that the, the skin, subcutaneous tissue, as well as the mucosa of the nasal cavity and the paranasal sinuses, they are they, they get their sensory innovation from the three from the two divisions of trigeminal. So we, we write, the, this is how we write V1, V2, and there is a V3, okay? So V1 is the, I'm, I'm using the green color for V1. So V1 is the ophthalmic division, okay? This is going to cover the skin of the forehead, the orbital structures, like the sensory, I'm talking about the sensory innovation of the orbits, especially up to the, the roof and the lateral walls, and then the dorsum of the nose and also the top part, the, the, the top part of the nose is being receiving, like up to here, the nasal bridge, I can say. This is V1 or ophthalmic division. Ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve, fifth cranial nerve, right? Then the purple color is representing the, the maxillary division or V2, all right? So the, the floors of the orbits, also the lateral walls of the nose, I'm talking about the skin, subcutaneous tissue, as well as the mucosa. So here you know that we have this whole thing is being under the control of innovation of V2 and you know that the, the maxillary sinuses are looking okay so now we will talk about the innovation or the nerve supply of the nose and the paranasal sinuses okay the nerve supply uh, could be of two types, uh, the sensory innovation, which is for general sensation of pain, touch, pressure, temperature, and then um, the special innovation, which is in case of nose, is the uh, sense of olfaction, right? And we just have discussed in the previous video that there is an olfactory epithelium, which is uh, uh, nothing but the collection of bipolar neurons which are the part of the first pair of cranial nerves that is the olfactory nerve. So oh, we won't talk about the special sensation, uh, the, we'll focus over the general sensory uh, supply of the nose and the perinasal sinuses and that you should keep in mind that includes the, the innovation of the skin subcutaneous tissue and also the nasal mucosa as well as the mucosae of the paranasal sinuses, okay? And then there is another type of uh, innovation, the autonomic innovation, which is actually the functional type, okay? Because the, there, are, there are two limbs of autonomic system that is the sympathetic and parasympathetic. We know that all the viscera, uh, that also includes the glands, the glandular tissue, they, and the blood vessels, they have the, the, the control 
uh, they, their control is uh, by the autonomic system, autom autonomic nervous system. Okay, so the the parasympathetic is known as is also known as the secretomotor system, while the sympathetic is also known as the vasomotor system. So it usually the sympathetic system has a hold on the the vasculature of the entire body. It, it controls the movement of or the uh, the uh, ability to contract of the smooth muscles of blood vessels, while the uh, the parasympathetic system or the parasympathetic limb of the autonomic system, it controls the uh, the secretory processes like the the it has a control over the glandular tissue of our body. Okay, so the nose and the paranasal sinuses they have a mucosa. So the mucosa is having the blood vessels as well as the mucus secreting glands. They need the, the autonomic uh, nervous control. Okay. So first we'll talk about the uh, sensory innovation pattern. And when we talk, when we say the sensory innovation of the nose and paranasal sinuses, the first nerve that comes to our mind is the fifth cranial nerve, fifth pair of cranial nerve that is the trigeminal nerve okay it has three roots i'll talk about this nerve in detail when we'll do the cranial nerves lecture okay but at this moment we are concerned with two of its divisions so the trigeminal is having a division which is also known as v1 or ophthalmic division ophthalmic ophthalmic division or V1 of trigeminal. It also has a division that is V2 or it's, it's also known as the maxillary division. The names have been given to these divisions according to the regions they are covering. Okay? Ophthalmic division, as we can understand by the name, it must be covering the ophthalmic area, the, especially the orbit and the contents of the orbits. And the maxillary division is predominantly is, is innovating the uh, maxillary area, okay? The top part of our face, uh, rather middle part of our face, okay? All right, so orange is representing the maxillary division or V2, and green is representing the ophthalmic division or V1. Here, you just uh, come to this drawing. This is a section, a mid sagittal section through the nose, and you, we can see the lateral wall of the nose, and same goes to the septum also, keep in mind. So the same pattern will be uh, uh, represented on the septum. So uh, you can see over here that we have the turbinates. And the green color, that is the ophthalmic division, is, is covering, it's, it's innovating the mucosa of the frontal sinus, the sphenoidal sinus, the sphenoethmoidal recess, the superior meatus, the mucosa over the superior meatus, uh, sorry, superior concha, the mucosa on top of the middle concha, and also you can see over here, even from the side, it's also covering this part of the nose, which is the dorsum of the nose, the bridge of the nose, okay? If you look just a picture beside this picture, is the, is the front of the face, okay? And you can see the entire skin and the subcutaneous tissue of the forehead, that is the part of scalp, the eyebrows, and the, the, uh, the uh, roof of the orbital cavity as well as the side walls of the orbital cavity, medial and lateral, uh, they are covered by, uh, and also the dorsum of the nose, the bridge of the nose, okay, just the dorsum. Hmm? The skin and subcutaneous tissue plus the mucosa, they are innovated by the ophthalmic division, the first division of trigeminal nerve, okay? Then we come to the second division, which is represented in orange, the maxillary division. You can see from inside the, the, uh, the inferior, the mucosa over the inferior turbinate or the inferior concha, and the entire maxilla, the region 
which is having like the hard palate and also the roots of the teeth. Everything has been covered by or has been innovated by the maxillary division of trigeminal, okay? So if you look at this skull, these, if you remember, these were the nasal processes or the frontal processes of maxilla. They are also making the lateral walls of the nose. So the dorsal of the nose, the skin of the dorsal of the nose is covered by, it's innovated by the V1 of Tamic division, but the lateral wall, the skin on top of the lateral wall of the nose are innovated by the V2, that is the maxillary division, okay? It's important because uh, sometimes in shingles, which is the herpes infection, a virus, a viral infection, people suffer from trigeminal neuralgia. It's mostly the V1 which is affected and sometimes V2 as well. So the, the, the pattern of uh, innovation is important uh, as far as the, the course of shingles is concerned, okay? All right, so um, yeah, so here, and you can see the upper, upper jaw or the maxillary teeth, the roots of the maxillary teeth are also innovated by the branches of maxillary division of trigeminal. okay? Same is the case with the maxillary air sinuses, okay? So the frontal sinus is innovated, the two frontal sinuses are innovated by the um, branches from V1 of thalamic division. The ethmoidal air sinuses are also innovated by the ophthalmic division branches, while the maxillary sinuses uh, mucosa uh, are innovated by the uh, branches of the maxillary division or V2. Okay, so there is the map, and I hope that you must have seen these the, these these kind of maps everywhere in every atlas of anatomy. Okay, as far as the autonomic control or the functional control, ner nervous control of the nose and paranasal sinuses is concerned, we have to think about the autonomic system, autonomic nervous system, and all right, so the parasympathetic. Parasympathetic is controlling the secretions of secretory activities of the mucosal glands. Okay. In case of overstimulation of parasympathetic wing of autonomic nervous system, there would be too much production of mucus and everything. Okay. The sympathetic stimulation is. Sympathetic or sympathetic um, wing of the autonomic nervous system is it, it, it is controlling the vasculature of the nasal cavity, nasal mucosa as well as paranasal mucosa. So if there is sympathetic overstimulation, there would be vasoconstriction. That's just like it's happening everywhere in the body, that there would be vasoconstriction and there would be decreased in the blood supply of that region and that will ultimately be leading to the decrease in the secretory activity of the glands, okay? So, uh, in nutshell, the uh, sensory innovation of the nose and paranasal sinuses is under the control of the two divisions of trigeminal nerve, fifth cranium, and the uh, functional uh, innovation or the motor innovation of the uh, nose and paranasal sinuses is under the control of sympathetic and parasympathetic wings of the autonomic nervous system. Okay? Uh, by the way, the lymphatic drainage is it's also very important, just like in any other region of the body. The, name, the nose and paranasal sinuses lymphatic drainage is following the pattern of the veins. And uh, most of the, the lymphatics or the lymph from the nose nasal cavity is is uh, going to the retropharyngeal group of lymph nodes, 
and the, the lower, the anterior inferior region of the nasal cavity, the lymph from the an anterior inferior region is mostly getting collected in the, uh, the cervical group of lymph nodes, first uh, to the submandibular group of lymph nodes and then to the cervical group of lymph nodes. So we can easily picture in our mind that in case of metastasis, uh, the, uh, the cancer cells, they usually take the route of uh, lymphatic system, so the, the nasal cancers, they can spread to the pharynx through the retropharyngeal lymph nodes.